FVC. Uh, my name is Joshua Oyugi. I serve as one of the pastors here uh, at FVC. Happy New Year for those who we have not met uh, this year. My task today is to preach from Luke chapter 22 from verse 1 to 23. So first I'll begin by reading uh, the entire text then uh, get to listen what God has to say to us this morning. So Luke 22, 1 to 23. I'll be reading from the ESV version. Now the feast of the living bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he concerted and sought an opportunity to betray um, to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man crying, carrying, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a larger room, furnished. Prepare it there. And he went out and there went and found it. And they went and found it. As just he had told them, and the Passover, and they prepared the Passover, sorry. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have honestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me and likewise the cup after he had eaten saying this is the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood but behold the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table for the son of man goes at his as it has been determined but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed and they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. Uh, please allow me to pray for us as you pray for me, even as I share God's word. Even as you pray for me, please uh, pray for my right eye. I barely slept uh, last night because it was um, itching. So pray that the Lord, uh, Lord will heal me as well. So let us pray. God, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for this text. Uh, we pray even as we dive into it, we pray the Lord you will uh, reveal yourself. The Lord you will help us to humbly uh, learn from you. Teach us, rebuke us, correct us, O oh Lord, so the Lord we can be thoroughly equipped for your good work. Help us obey whatever you have learned by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, now growing up with my mom was, uh, was fun. You know, as most of you know, or some of you know, I grew up with a single parent. My dad um, went to bed with the Lord when I was so young. And so my, my mom was technically everything. She was the plumber of the house. She was the engineer. And most importantly, she was the doctor. And I, count, I can count the number of times we went to the hospital. Uh, we rarely did so because my mom uh, used to, you know, check the symptoms of whatever we are suffering from and either buy us medicine from the counter or who would make some herbal medicine. Now, in some cases, her prescription did work, but in some, her prescriptions failed terribly. And this is the reason why, because my mom used to treat the symptoms rather than the disease. And in our text of scripture today, we have two problems. There is a minor problem and there is a major problem. Okay, so the minor problem is that there is an enmity between the Jews and the Romans. There's this hostility between these two people, these two nations. And so the, the Romans were the superpowers. And so the Jews had 
a problem with the Romans because the Pilate had, so, had done so many horrendous things to the Jews, from kicking people, abusing people, and there was a time he even took images of Caesar and went to them into the temple, and that was idolatry to the Jews. He had massacred Galileans, and he had just done so many things that made the Jews hate him. Therefore, this led to a rise of revolutionaries, you know, trying to make the life of the Roman government a little bit difficult. So the Jews were waiting for the Messiah who had been promised from the Old Testament, okay? And so prophets like Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah had prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. And so they are waiting for this change because they knew the Messiah was coming to reign. He was coming to conquer and to finish everything. But... Not everyone in Jew was waiting for something new to happen. For example, the priests who were, um, most of them were Sadducees, they were happy with where they were at because they were wealthy and privileged. And for them, as long as the Romans favored them and the temple was protected, they were okay. On the other hand, the Pharisees were hopeful, but for them, they believed that God was punishing them for their unfaithfulness. And so for them to be saved as Israel, they believed Israel had to live very, very pure lives. And that's why the Pharisees uh, really urged people to, to obey the law to the letter. And that's why they were very strict with the law. Now, the Messiah that they have been waiting for is here. He has arrived. He actually announced his arrival. When he said in Luke, chapter four, in Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind. And so Jesus closed the scroll at that particular point in Luke chapter 4 and he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled. So Jesus was basically saying, the Messiah that you have been waiting for is right here in your midst. But the religious leaders did not like this Messiah because one, they were astonished with his teaching, but also his teaching kind of pricked their hearts. His, his teaching exposed the wickedness of the religious leaders. And that's why Luke comes into this text and he says they were seeking to kill this Jesus. So Jesus came to attack the greater enemy, the bigger problem, which was sin. So Jesus is coming to attack the enemy who was there from the beginning of the Garden of Eden and that slavery of sin and the devil. Church, unfortunately, the 20, our 21st century problem is the same problem with the audience of the first century. We often think our problem is external. But our problem is eternal. Our problem is sin which resides in us. So Luke says, the feast of the unleavened bread was drawing near, which was called the Passover. Now, this was a very important day for the Jews. It was the day that they used to commemorate the day that they were delivered from the hands of the Egyptians. Now, the night of the Passover, what happened? God Asked the, God asked Moses to tell all Israelites to slaughter a spotless lamb and to apply the blood of the lamb on the doors and lintels. And when God, and God will pass them over when the destroyer comes to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians. And so the Lord passed them over and that's why it was called the Passover. And so the Lord literally saved Israel from death and he kept the destroyer from entering their homes. And this signified a national liberation for the Israelites. It's just like the Kenyan Madaraka Day or Independence Day where we get to celebrate our independence from the British colonialists. Now, during this festival, many people gathered. It was a huge festival and many people gathered to celebrate this day. And that's why Luke writes that they feared, they were afraid to kill Jesus because the crowds could have caused civil disturbance. And the Romans, what the Romans wanted was peace. They did not want any revolution. So Jesus had gained a lot of popularity because he was a good teacher. He was a good teacher and he had done numerous miracles. He has challenged the life and teaching of the religious leaders. At a particular point, he made a triumphant entry at Jerusalem and he cleansed the temple. And that rubbed um, 
the Pharisees on the wrong way and they didn't like him. And so from that point onwards, from the time he began his ministry, they made every effort to discredit him or to get him into the trouble with the Roman authorities. Now, when their efforts failed, something interesting happens. Judas decided to betray Jesus. The chief priests were delighted to have Judas approach them with this offer. Actually, the text says, Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and they agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. The devil influenced Judas. Satan was the main motivation and energy behind Judas betraying Jesus. Now, this does not absolve Judas from his responsibility to betray his master, Jesus. The, the, the devil did not coerce Judas. Judas, com, Jesus, Judas thought about this, okay? Because the verse, 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 um, the, the verse 6 says he sought for an opportunity to betray him. This was a premeditated thing. Though he meditated about it, he thought about it, you know, he inquired about it. And so this was a decision that intentionally thought about it. And he said he's going to betray his master. So Judas is equally responsible, even though God is sovereignly in charge. That's why Matthew tells us that Judas asked, what are you willing to give me? So Judas was actually, he had planned about it and he knew, the, the, he, he had laid, he had, he had kind of laid a price tag on Jesus. He had placed a price tag on Jesus. And yet he didn't know that Jesus was going to be the ultimate prize for his sins. Now, according to the book, the ultimate prize that is going to deliver him from his sins and to deliver the world from his sins. Now, according to the book of, of John, it seems like Judas had not been born again. John 13, 10 to 13 says this, The one who was birthed does not need to wash except for his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that's why he said, not all of you are clean. Church, brothers, sisters, you can be so close to Jesus, yet so far away from him. Judas knew everything about his master. And sometimes we can know what to say, know where to do. We can do all the religious activities we ought to do as Christians. We can read the Bible, we can go to church, you can go for vigils. But if we have never come to believe in him, then we don't really know him. Do you remember Jesus saying, many will come to me in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we chase demons in your name? And Jesus will tell them, Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Do you know this Lord Jesus today or do you know about him? Now there's something bigger, you know, there's something bigger right here. There's something in play right here that is much bigger than we think. So for the Jews and the scribes, it was probably a political issue. But for Jesus, this was a spiritual issue. You know, and for the devil, this was a spiritual issue because the Bible says, and Satan entered Judas. Now, we know from the Old Testament, from the scriptures, that Satan has always been opposed to God. He's not a passive foe, you know, just chilling, you know, in the beach of Diani or Hawaii, you know, enjoying some cold margarita. No, on the contrary, the Bible says he's an ever acting ruler of this world who is constantly at work on the earth during this present age. First Peter 5.8 says he prowls like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We know him as a deceiver. He is the father of lies. He disguises himself as an angel of light. He traps and deceives believers, holding them, to captive, holding them captive to do his will. Now, Satan has always been seeking to thwart the grand redemptive plan of God. From the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, do you remember? And then when Judas, when Jesus was with his disciples and he tells them he needs to go to, to Jerusalem and suffer many things, Peter um, 
moves with Jesus aside and he rebukes Jesus and Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. You see, you know how Satan is so uh, deceiving. And then even in Jesus' earthly ministry, he was ever present. Satan and the demons were immensely engaged in Jesus' earthly ministry. So, sometimes we Christians fall in the danger of either trivializing the devil or fearing him. And I've heard so many songs in this country where we treat the devil as a mere object which we can stone um, or kick away. Christians, a wrong view of the devil is detrimental to our Christian walk and is detrimental to how we are going to fight our spiritual wars. Before you go to any war, you are always advised to know well your enemy. And the devil possesses the highest power of created things. We human beings do not possess the same supernatural power the devil does. And that's why the Bible tells us to depend on God. Ephesians 6, 12, Paul urges us that, Paul tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. So God's power is incomparable with the devil's power. You cannot compare at all. God is all powerful, but the devil is not. So Christian, don't fear the devil. Rather lean on him who is stronger than the devil. Lean on him, depend on him who created the devil. However strong demons and the devil might look like, God is all powerful. They actually unwittingly serve God's purpose, just like in this text. Do you remember in Jesus' earthly ministry, they were terrified of him. They were terrified of Christ and the gospel, and they obeyed Christ. Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is supreme over all things, the invisible and the visible, be it thrones, dominions, or authorities. He's supreme over all those things. The next verse says, Then came the day of the unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And they will show you a large upper room, furnished, prepare it there. And they went, found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, Jesus sends two of his disciples who are, who are in his inner circle. You know, Jesus had the twelve, and then he had the three, the three that was Peter, uh, John, and James. And so he sends Peter and John to prepare a place where they're going to have the Passover meal. Probably Jesus did this because he knew if he publicly said where they're going to have the Passover meal, Judas would have gotten the opportunity to actually betray him. Do you remember in the earlier verses, Jesus sought, uh, Judas sought for an opportunity to betray him privately? And that's the, prob that, that's the reason why Jesus did not uh, confide to Judas or reveal to the rest of the disciples why he was, where he was going to have the meal. And it is even evident on how Jesus chose to disclose this information. He did not give the address of the location. He did not send a pin. <laughs> you know, in a modern day, that's what, that's what would have happened. You know, but rather he just told them, this guy is carrying a jar of water. Peter and John would have no problem locating the man because this was basically, in that culture, it was basically uh, the task of a woman to fetch water. But still, the disciples were to find the unspecified address with the man. They obeyed Jesus. Just think about it. Probably if it was not Jesus asking them to do that, maybe they wouldn't have gone. But they obeyed their master. Why? Because they knew their master. This was not the first time Jesus was giving them such instructions. Do you remember when Jesus was entering Jerusalem? He sent two of his disciples to go and untie a colt and bring them to him. And he says, if anyone asks you where you are taking the colt, you should just tell them the Lord needs it. And so they had come to trust Jesus. And in both, this, and in both of these situations, 
everything turned out exactly the way Jesus, you know, had described. So indeed, all things belong to the Lord and they were created by him and for him and through him. The, the disciples may not have known the outcome of this story, but they trusted in their master. Church, brothers and sisters, even in the midst of our suffering or uncertainties, we can trust in God's providence because he, know, he knows he not only knows how things will turn out, he has ordained how things will turn out. All we need to do is just to obey and trust the things that he has said. We may not know the outcome of this COVID. We don't know even when it will come to an end. We may not know if our relatives will be healed from that uh, disease. We may not know how our kids will turn out, but we can rest in his plan. We can rest in his will, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. He cannot let himself down because his glory is at stake. So he'll accomplish every purpose he desires to accomplish. Brothers, sisters, Christian, all God's providential actions in time conform to a fixed purpose that precedes time. So Jesus does not disclose this information because he knew the religious leaders were waiting for, they are waiting to kill him. And this could be the ideal time. Think about it because everyone will be at their home, you know, celebrating the Passover and they will just have come and taken Jesus and killed him. Then the Bible says that the hour has come. It's like the moment has come. Actually, the hour has come basically means that the time has come for something to be made or to be finished. And Jesus basically, he's trying to say, I'm about to reveal to you. Luke is actually saying that Jesus is about to say, I'm about to reveal to you the sole reason of why I came. And of course, he did that a few times. You know, there's a time he say he came to give his life as a ransom for many. He said he not come for those who are healthy, but he came for those who are sick. But Jesus is about to say this just a day before his death. It's like in a movie, you know, when the villain has terrorized almost everyone and people are losing on hope and the hero comes into the story. And at that moment, we can say the hour has come because we know the villain and all his friends will experience a thorough beating. And at such moments, that's when you grab your popcorns and enjoy the movie because you know the villain is going to put things right. You know for sure that is the beginning of the end of that villain. So, when the author says the hour has come, he means this is a very important and passionate moment for Jesus because he has arrived at the sole reason as to why he came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to constitute a new covenant with men based on his own sacrifice, not on a sacrifice of lamb or gods, but his own body. He is the prize. And he asks his disciples to commemorate his death and resurrection, which will be happening the next day. And that's why he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after that eaten saying, this cup that is poured for you is the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus is basically saying, I am the ultimate Passover lamb who is going to rescue you from the world of sin, who is going to rescue you from the world of sin and death. Jesus' death was not the beginning of the end, but rather it was the beginning of the beginning. The problem of the Jews had a solution and the solution was not lamp and gods but it was Jesus Christ himself. And so Jesus is saying, I am now the Passover lamb. And so Jesus just changed the whole thing from the Passover to the Lord's Supper. And that's why each and every month here at LVC, we get to rejoice and to commemorate that day when our Lord and Savior Jesus died in honor of him. And even as we celebrate what he did for us on the cross, not only celebrate, but also a constant reminder for us to continue leaning on the power of, on the power of the cross, on, on the power of what he did on the cross through, you know, the indwelling Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. So Jesus says he will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. Hold on. What does he mean? What does he mean he will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes? 
we know the kingdom came. Actually, he said in Mark chapter 1, you know, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And also in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 to 21, it says the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Lo, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. How can he say in this particular portion of scripture, till the kingdom is fulfilled, or till the kingdom comes? So is the kingdom of God here? Yes, the kingdom of God is here. Is the kingdom of God coming? Yes, the kingdom of God is coming. So the kingdom of God is both present and future. The kingdom of God has come in Christ. He is the arrival of the kingdom. Even though he does not overturn the Romans at that particular moment, we know one day he will. He will reign over them. He will reign over all nations. And he says, I will not eat until it is fulfilled. So Jesus basically means he will not eat it until all the people who, we, who, will, who will be have ransomed through his death on the cross are gathered back to him. Those who are given to him by the Father, those whom the Father has set his love upon them in eternity past on the basis of nothing in themselves, but solely on the good pleasure of God's will. Those people who the Lord has elected, who has chosen before the foundations of this world, Jesus says he will not have the Passover meal again until they have been gathered to him. And these people are from every tribe and every nation. So the Passover can't be fulfilled until all the people are reached and gathered and the kingdom of God is established. And we see a glimpse of that in Revelation 5 verse 9 to 10 when it says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and your blood, and your blood you ransomed people for God, for every tribe and language, and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Jesus is telling the disciples, You eat this in remembrance of me, but I'm going to wait until I can eat it anew with you and with all the ransom that you'll have gathered from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. The ultimate Passover lamp is here because the yearly sacrifices and festivals were a foreshadow of the substance. Jesus was the fulfillment. So but the, the Passover was not just a past celebration, but it was a celebration of the future when the Messiah comes. Then verse 23 says, The Son of Man goes as it has been determined. Now, the betrayal and the death of Jesus was ordained. God's gracious redemptive plan has its origin in eternity past is the sovereign counsel of the will of the triune God. And so we can depend on his sovereignty. Church, we still have the biggest problem with us. But we also have the ultimate solution and that is the cross of Christ. And so Jesus died on the cross. And the cross has no significance without the person, okay? Because we had so many people who died, who were crucified. But the reason why Jesus is impo- the, 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 the cross of Christ is important is not because of the cross, the wooden cross, but rather it is because of the person of Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. And so we trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Are you here? And you have never known this Lord. You have never known this Jesus. Now the scribes and the Pharisees rejected him. They rejected the Savior that came to die for them. But in God's sovereign providence, their rejection of the Messiah will lead to the redemption of the world. In their sinful house, they were killing Jesus. But in God's seamless plan, they were being used as vessels to fulfill the promise of redemption. An unbeliever, will you turn away from your sin and believe in the gospel? That Jesus came to be our mediator and died in our place as a substitution for the forgiveness of anyone who repents and believes. Will you trust in him today? So that when you trust in him, you become justified and you are treated just as if you never sinned. But you are also you are treated just as if you've kept the perfect law of God. Believer, will you, lean, will you learn to depend on the same Jesus who died for you on the cross? and rose again 
And he did not leave us, but rather he resides in us through the Holy Spirit. And he aids us in our daily walk with God. We are more prone to depend on our moral willpower for our ability to grow spiritually. Let's not forget we are not agents of transformation. We are objects of transformation. The agent of transformation is the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Let's not forget that Christ is our righteousness. And I'll finish with this quote from Scott Robert, who says, to that righteousness is the eye of the believer to be directed. On that righteousness must he rest. On that righteousness must he live. On that righteousness must he die. On that righteousness must he appear before the judgment seat. In that righteousness must he stand forever in the presence of a righteous God. Amen. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your word. Help us lean on you, to lean on you daily to depend on you daily because we know all blessings that we have are on the basis of the fact that we have believed in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to obey your word and to listen or to, to, to get to be sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit for our joy and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.